Welcome to Not Everything Sucks with Andrew. We're so grateful that we have uh, all y'all hanging out with us on Facebook Live and on the podcast app. And I'm even more grateful that we have Gio Ordonez here with us hanging Hi. out. How are you doing? Doing pretty good. How awesome. are you? Awesome. I'm, I'm <laughs> hungry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we are making twice baked avocados that sounds pretty delicious so if you if you are familiar with twice baked potatoes kind of the same concept except we're not baking them at all (laughs) today we are talking women's rights and uh, no better person comes to mind uh, to talk about this than yourself thank you um geo tell us a little bit about you and uh, your work with Ignites. Okay, cool. Um, so hi, Gio here. Um, <laughs> I, I just finished up a year with uh, a fellowship through Ignite. Ignite is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that is geared towards empowering women to run for office. Awesome. Um, and so, I mean, you know a little bit about, we spent time in student government together, this served as true. presidents. Um, and so that's kind of like my interest peak started with politics Mm. and ignite again is like totally mission is to get more women to run for office if you don't know geo was the student body president of saint mary's university have you um madam student body president have you ever (laughs) cut an avocado (laughs) have you ever cut an avocado before i have and apparently i do it wrong like (laughs) The way I cut them is this way, <laughs> but like apparently you're supposed to cut that way. So I don't know. It's not wrong. Okay. Um, but that's not <laughs> but how we're gonna cut it today. Perfectly fine. <laughs> so we're gonna take an avocado. Um, here you go. Thank you. We're gonna cut it the w- long way. Uh, here's a knife. Um, and what we're going to do with these? Take the sticker off because we're actually gonna use the outside of the avocado. Crazy, <laughs> I know. Um. And uh, this is the worst sticker to ever be on a avocado, ever. Oh my gosh. Okay, there we go. Okay. So we're gonna cut it across. We have salt, pepper, basil leaves, some garlic salt, about three tablespoons of salsa, um, some cheese. So we're going kind of easy today. Cool. Um, and what we're going to do? I oh, right. I did it right. That, that's that's <laughs> awesome. Do you know how to take the seed out? Okay, no. Okay, that's fine. No. That's fine. I, <laughs> this is as far as my Ten weeks ago, go. I had no idea either. Um, holy moly. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to not cut my fingers off or hands off. Um, you just kind of Ooh, okay. stab it and then twist okay. it. So. I might not One more that. time. One more time. Eh. Oh, there we go. My heart literally <laughs> just kind of died there. I was like, please keep your fingers. <gasps> that is okay, so what we're going to do, if, if you can bring the bowl, this one? Okay. Um, we're going to scoop out the avocados, trying to keep the shell intact, and okay. we're going to put it in here and I'll mash them. Cool? Okay, cool. So, Gio, what are women's rights? Um, so, women's rights um, are is basically uh, women having you know women and men being on an equal playing field um easily put women having equality politically socially and economically simply put so because we talk about women's rights there is obviously a need to Mm -hmm. um why, why where did the notion that women are somehow less than a man or men come from? Where, 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 would we just wake up one day and suddenly men are superior? Like, how did how did that happen? So, um, women have were the way in which we kind of look at why it is that we're having this conversation is because of the roles that women have been placed um, historically. Okay. So when we talk about um, roles in which women were placed, it's it's basically roles women placed. Uh, by society. Interesting. Um, and so, kind of like in reflecting about our conversation today, um, roles, typical traditional roles that were women were placed in were, mm-hmm. of course, as a caretaker of the home, okay. um, as the um, 
as someone that needed to be proper and you know ultimately um if we're going like way back essentially sure. being property of of the husband and so these are roles that historically women have been placed in um through society a society run basically um by men historically um and so I guess like to kind of preface the conversation as well, sure. something that I definitely want to emphasize is like, you know, the experiences that I bring also come as like being a young Latina, one of the first to graduate in, in my family. Mm -hmm. And honestly, these are roles that I definitely saw a lot of women in my family take because it was like understood that you are a, a Latina mother, mm -hmm. wife, you stay home, you take care of the kids. Um, so it was always reinforced personally in, in my life. How did that reinforcement when you were young um, shape and mold you, say, up until high school? So, so kind of prefacing, not only did I grow up in a traditional Latina household, Latino mm -hmm. household, but in a very traditional Catholic household. And mm. so from pre-K on, um, I went to private Catholic school and so the way it was kind of like really brought in my life was was simply through like the teachings we would be taught and again like those examples that I had in my life and up until high school I kind of like accepted it all because it was all I really understood right mm -hmm. um, so I would remember like my parents telling me um, you know ultimately you're going to be a mother one day and that'll be the most important role you have and make sure you know how to cook because you want to make your husband and your and your family happy and so this was always reinforced throughout high school because I was in that kind of environment mm -hmm. um, which is really ironic because my mom is the first to graduate her with her bachelor's and her master's and she you know I remember my dad cooking food for us <laughs> so I'm always like Okay, like now I'm like, y'all did not reinforce them that much because mom <laughs> went to school. Um, but it was, it was reinforced through high school and on. So you are now someone who has empowered women professionally as of what you do. You wake up in the morning and you go and you empower women. Mm -hmm. um, how were you first empowered? So I think with a lot of us, um, college is kind of a time for us to really explore what it is, you know, different ideas, right? Um, and it was in college, freshman year, being on my own, I was the first to move away from our home okay. um, in our family. Everyone had lived in Fort Worth up until me. And so um, it was until that I got to college and I was living on my own, cooking for myself, making sure tuition was paid on my own that I, mm -hmm. I really realized like there's much more to me than than the roles that I was being told um, and it was through the women that I started to interact with my professors Latinas mm -hmm. first time I had seen that mentors Latinas professional women council women state representatives that I was seeing I, I started seeing myself in them mm. and it made me think like there's so much more to the role of a woman, a Latina woman, mm -hmm. than I thought. And that was kind of like the shift in my mentality, was seeing myself and other women around me. What was the catalyst to prompt you to become the lead student leader mm -hmm. of your university? Before we get into that, we're gonna get quick to the avocados. <laughs> okay. Feels like a commercial. It, yeah, go, it back does. To the, <laughs> go back to the avocados. So we put in some salsa, we mix it in. Um, if you can grab the garlic and basil garlic. Um, and kind of just give as much of that as you want to in this. Okay. Um, I'm gonna put in some salt and pepper. Uh, and then um, I'll start mixing it. Oh my lord. Sorry. <laughs> It's like garlic going everywhere. I know. Um, and then uh, as we're kind of mixing this around, we're going to get it to a nice uh, consistency, not quite okay. all the way mashed, but almost there. Um, please, Gio, tell us how you got uh, to the place where you are now the lead student representative of your school. Um, so it didn't come 
easy. So I, I had shared with you a little bit earlier something that I really hadn't shared with folks was that when it came to me running for office on campus, it was a role that I never saw myself in. I actually, you know, as I told you, Andrew, um, I wanted to be only vice president and I wanted to just leave the guy who was in charge to be in charge because I thought, well, I'll just stand in the background, make sure everything's working right. And if it's not, like, I'll step in and kind of take things that way. Sure. Um, but it wasn't until I had a mentor of mine sit me down and, like, straight up, like, real talk with me on, you know, asking me, like, tough questions. Like, why is it that you don't see yourself as a leader? Everyone else sees you but yourself. So why is that? Um and it was through her guidance mm-hmm. that that it it was it, I started realizing a little bit more on like you know maybe there is more to my role in the student government mm-hmm. um and I just had a lot of reinforcement um that way what what now do you see uh one woman empowering another woman. What kind of impact does that make on our society? So, I mean, I think what it, I mean, it, what it does is it starts a conversation, right? Mm. Um, me coming back, coming from a traditional Latino Catholic family, because of one woman empowering another I was able to see my abilities in a whole different spectrum and that was through a conversation that we had Mm. um and essentially led me to do things that I had never thought I would be able to do right um and so that's what I see it doing is being able to empower other women is starting conversations Mm -hmm. and starting to help people realize like there's so much more to you as an individual than what you think you are, you know? Um, at least that's what it did for me. And with sure. my time with Ignite, it's something that the women that I worked with, you know, some of the best things that we did mm-hmm. together was sit down and talk as a community. With There was one time that we had um, lunch with elected officials, and it was with City Councilwoman Villagran, um, and a couple of other women who were in pretty big roles in nonprofits running for office. Sure. And it was such an impactful time because I looked around and I saw women like me in leadership roles. And I remember talking to the girls, the, high, the college girls that uh, are involved in Ignite, and that was one thing that they kept saying. Like, it was so cool to see a, a, a Latina just graduate from law school and is now running for judge and it started it was like those conversations that we were able to start um that made it impactful and that i've been able to experience through ignite in my time at saint mary's we're going to take our avocado shells okay and i'll give you the spoon i'll take my spoon and uh, we're going to take this concoction that we've created and put it back in the avocado (laughs) from whence it came so we're gonna go ahead and uh, go ahead and put these back in um so this recipe actually was submitted uh by my mom Ooh. I know. It's a, it's a mom recipe. A mom recipe. Those are the best. They they usually are. So <laughs> here's fingers crossed, right? Um, we're going to put these, and then we're going to put cheese on top, on of, top them. of them. And uh, here in a moment, we're going to uh, mi- microwave them to get the cheese <laughs> melted. Because <laughs> we classy, but we're not that classy. <laughs> but this is honestly like a recipe you can do in your college dorm. Absolutely. This yeah, is this with is the microwave. Co- this is like this is perfect. Easy. This is perfect. I'm I'm a big fan. Yeah, we, we <laughs> didn't we didn't get all of them filled, so let's there cap these go. off. Um, Geo, I want to buckle up for a second. Okay. Can we buckle up? We're buckling up. Um, President Trump. Um, he was elected mm-hmm. a little while ago. Yeah. What did his election mean for women? women. Um, so 
what he meant for women. Um, this is going to be a, a little difficult to share uh, sure. just because like even in my family, there's a lot of division, you know, mm-hmm. like it's un- I, I don't understand it, but there's division. So sure. um, what I see his effect is is in multiple ways okay. um, and in negative ways that I that I have seen. Um, you know, when we think of what his effects have had on on women, we think of the first thing we think is like women women's health. Um, okay. And with him gutting key provisions within um, the Affordable Care Act, um, it meant getting rid of free birth control and and being able to to have women have that ability have access to free birth control. Sure. That's one effect in which I've seen a small effect. Another is um, during President Obama's time, um, something that he had done to kind of understand the gender pay gap a little more um, was setting a, a rule for um, big corporations to basically report to the government on how they were paying their employees based on gender and race. Mm. and. Uh, President Trump put a pause on that. Um, And so that's another small effect that I see, negative effects. Um, So when it comes to women's rights, I would have to say Trump has had a very negative effect, in my opinion, not only to women as a whole, um, but, you know, Latinas, Mm. African-American women. Um, Because when it comes to, like, birth control, for example, uh, minority women are the ones that are most affected to a certain extent by this. Sure. Uh, when we look at poverty, when we look at the workforce, when we think of gender pay, all of this is stemming back from, like, stems back to motherhood. Mm-hmm. And I, we can dive a little more into that, but essentially that's kind of like the effects that I have seen. But one positive thing that I would say is that it was kind of an awakening, Mm. especially for me. It was an awakening for me as a Latina because, you know, as I was saying earlier, we, for the first time, had a female that was the closest to becoming president. And she was educated. She was experienced. You know, all the things that you would think a woman would need to win, Mm -hmm. yet didn't win. And she was a white woman. And so coming in this as a Latina, it was kind of like, well, okay, like if a white woman can do it with all these qualifications, like what makes me feel like I can dream to be that? Because that's that, that just doesn't seem like a possibility for me, you know? Um, and so that's kind of like the effects that I think of. Um, but kind of stemming back to if there's something positive to come out of this, in my opinion, it is the fact that... Um, it was an awakening for women on both parties sure. that we as women are not a part of the conversations. We're not at the table. When we think of women in office, although we make 51% of the population, only about 20 to 21 to 22% are women mm-hmm. in, in running in office, right? And so this is a big chunk of the population that we're not representing in the policies that we write. Um, in just think of the effects that it has when we think of putting a pause to the payroll we didn't have women to be there to advocate on why this was a positive thing to have right um so that's kind of like the things that i saw personally Mm -hmm. um kind of effects that of the president of the president there is a lot of activity on the border between mexico Mm -hmm. and uh, texas especially Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of what you do after your fellowship with Ignite, uh, you've been doing some work uh, with organiz- with one organization mm-hmm. in particular in, in, in what is happening at the border. One, tell us a little bit about the work you've done and two, tell us how women, migrant women, are affected with some policy changes that have been happening. Okay, yeah. So... Um like the two, the two big passions in my life are women's rights and immigration. Okay. It's always, it was, um, and as I reflected on the conversation we were going to have tonight, 
it really stemmed back with the experiences that my own family had. You know, we had family women that immigrated here on their own. Um, and so I think that's why it's been a real passion of mine, kind of these two spectrums. Um, but with my work with Raices, um, I am the volunteer programs manager, so I pretty much am in charge of anything that deals with volunteers. Um, and so what you were alluding to at the beginning, uh, just now and in, mm -hmm. in with what's happening at the border we saw families being separated sure um, and so kind of in thinking about my two passions women and immigration I, I didn't see it fit until my time with Raices mm -hmm. and that is that migrant women when it comes to their basic human rights it's almost like non-existent for them in detention um, and the reason I say that is that, um, like for example, I think it was in in March, late March or, or April, mm -hmm. there was a provision under the Obama administration that said if a woman was uh, found out to be pregnant and was in detention, she would be released um, within 12 hours. Okay. Under um, the Trump administration, that provision was pulled back and now says that if a woman mm -hmm is found to be pregnant and doesn't currently have children, she can be held indefinitely. So if we think about women's health, um, this is a woman who is stuck in detention, which is pretty much like jail, pregnant, um, without the proper prenatal care that they may need, uh, without, I, and when we think about where detention centers are located in Texas, they're in really rural communities. So let's say we were to have a woman who has high risk pregnancy. There might not be a doctor around to take care of her pregnancy immediately like that, like, you know, us in San Antonio would be privileged to, right? Um, and so in my, my, with my time at Raices, it, it's been incredible to see kind of the, the, the connection between immigration and women's rights and, and the lack of, when we think about women's rights for immigrant women, Again, there, there, there are none. Sure. Um, and it's it's tough to see, you know, because yeah. when we're looking at it as like, uh, you know, uh, me being a privileged American who has documents, like we have it tough. But if we think about women who are traveling from countries where femicide is a thing, coming to a country where if you're found pregnant you can't get out of detention sure like it's it's incredible to think of, of that disparity within that <clears throat> we're uh we're gonna finish up with our avocados here in a second um let's go a couple of levels higher okay um men and women interact with each other mm -hmm. every day mm -hmm. uh and women are, are often faced with things that men do uh, that women really wish guys wouldn't do. Um, what are a couple of things that men should stop doing? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, we've all heard the phrase of stop mansplaining. So that's kind of like a thing, like let's stop mansplaining. Things. So what is mansplaining? Mansplaining is when a, a guy pretty much tries to, ex like, it's like a guy trying to explain a period to a woman. Like, that is like the, like a no-no. Like, we experience it. We know how it works, right? Sure. So, um, yeah, let's, I would say, like, stop mansplaining. And okay. then um, another thing that I've kind of realized now that I'm in the workforce is, um, kind of checking yourself when you're talking like in a meeting okay um and that kind of goes like for everyone uh, but like i've i've experienced it many times when i'm in a meeting and i say something mm -hmm. and it's a good idea but then i have like a male counterpart like say it and emphasize it and then it's like oh that's a great idea kind of thing mm -hmm. i'm like i just said that you know kind of thing sure um so it's realizing that that's a real thing um, and as a male being in a privileged position of, of being paid more than women or in, you know, historically having 
more power than a woman like be there as an advocate yeah. so you know a really simple tool that you can do and this is kind of like for everyone a real simple tool that you can do is is check yourself if you're talking too much and, and you have a counterpart who has something great to say but it sure. simply doesn't have the room empower that person to to say something right sure. um and as a male empower your female counterparts and kind of like back them up so like if i'm talking in a meeting and you agree with something i say like be vocal about it like be like geo that was such a great idea i'm so glad you came up with that because it's like a reinforcement right sure um so those are kind of like two things you know let's stop the mansplaining but also um be aware of the privilege that you have as a male and and empower your female counterparts um in any way possible we just sprinkled cheese on these avocado boats um we're gonna put these in the microwave, in the microwave. this is the first time we've ever used a microwave here are not everything sucks oh, okay um the first time i've ever used a microwave i'm just kidding ever? <laughs> um We'll put it on for maybe 30 seconds to get the cheese melted. Okay. Gio, we are called Not Everything Sucks. Yes. Which implies that things do suck, and we've talked quite a bit mm -hmm. about that. Um, Gio, what doesn't suck? What doesn't suck? Um, they're doing okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, like nervous they're going to explode. <laughs> um, okay, these are going out now. Gio, what doesn't suck? So what doesn't suck is, well, I have to say, first of all, the fact that we're having this conversation between you and I simply shows that not everything sucks because we have the ability to like, speak as friends and kind of learn from each other a little bit more about these different issues and hopefully like all the listeners as well. Um, so having these conversations make things not suck so much, right? Um, but if we're looking for a more tangible way to think of how things not suck and mm -hmm. to be proactive, um, I would say Ignite doesn't suck at all. It, in fact, it like does a lot for our community. Um, earlier, I shared a little bit about what Ignite is, a nonprofit, nonpartisan that is, empowers women to run for office. Uh, but the way in which we do that is through um, chapters throughout the universities in town. And so if you are um, an individual that wants mm -hmm. to continue the conversation on how do we bring more women into politics, joining an Ignite chapter or starting it at your university would be a great way to kind of make things not suck so much anymore. Um, within San Antonio, we have four chapters. Uh, the first one is at St. Mary's, Our Lady of the Lake, UTSA now, and UIW. And so you know i invite anyone who wants to com continue this conversation um learn more about what it is to be empowered to run for office um to join a chapter at a, of ignite um or start one at your university can you grab the chips yes. and we will try these um they don't look that bad they don't okay so great. we're just gonna go for it <laughs> um okay here we go Oh, very tasty. That's really good. That's not terrible at all. I never thought of like basil in oh block. My. Oh my gosh. <laughs> not everything sucks. Mm -hmm. Gio, thanks for hanging out with us, Thank telling us a little me. bit about how we can be Thank you. Uh, better humans. Um, <laughs> yeah, better humans, right? Thank you. Um, not everything sucks. We are glad we got to tell you just a little bit about why. See y'all later.